This is a challenge run of Pokemon Black called a Little Lock, which is a variant of a traditional Nuzlocke. The same rules of a traditional hardcore Nuzlocke apply here. I can't overlevel past a gym leader's best Pokemon. If a Pokemon faints, it's gone forever, and I can only catch the first Pokemon of a route. Also, I can't have duplicate Pokemon, because the game isn't fun if your team is entirely Pat Rat and Purloin. I can choose a new encounter if it would result in a duplicate Pokemon. In addition to these rules, I can only use unevolved Pokemon. No single stage Pokemon, no loopholes, only the basic form of a Pokemon. We've already finished Little Locks in Generations 3 and 4, so what's special about Generation 5? Pokemon Black only has Unova region Pokemon before the post game, which means that I'm gonna have to use Pokemon I've never used in a Little Lock before. Also, Generation 5 has interesting new mechanics, abilities, and strategies to take advantage from, like Lucky Chant, which prevents critical hits. Unfortunately, I have decided to ban the use of gems. They're effectively infinite and give you the same boost as a choice specs or choice ban, but without a drawback. They would have made the challenge too easy. I have not banned the item Eviolate, which is a new item introduced in black and white. It's fair because you can only use it once per team, and it adds a fun flavor to team building. Which Pokemon gets the Eviolate? Other than that, there's a whole lot of strategies I've never used before, so let's get right into it. First up, we have to pick the starter Pokemon. I want you to pause the video and guess which starter we're going to pick. Tepig the fire type, Oshawott the water type, or Snivy the grass type. While you're paused, make sure to subscribe to the channel if you're not already. If I see a lot of new subscribers, then I'm going to go ahead and make a little lock for Pokemon Black 2 or White 2. If you guess Tepig, you're right. One reason we picked Tepig is because fire type Pokemon are rare. When in doubt, always pick the fire type. But there's also another important reason. In black and white, you have two rivals, Bianca and Sharon, who pick the type you don't have. In a little lock, the late game is inherently more difficult than the early game because that's when you're fighting fully evolved Pokemon and your lack of stats really shows up. Preparing for the late game is incredibly important. Embor is a far more threatening Pokemon than Samurott or Superior. It's because of three reasons. One is that Embor gets Heat Crash, which is a move that does more damage the more weight difference there is between the two Pokemon. Because all our Pokemon are tiny, Embor's Heat Crash will always be an amazing 120 base power. Number two, Embor gets Rollout, which means it can spiral out of control. Number three, the other two starters are completely beaten by Fungus, which we can guarantee to get later in the game. Ultimately, we want to remove Embor from the list of Pokemon that we would have to fight late game. After picking the starter, we go on to our early game encounters. We get Lillipup in Route 1 and Patrat in Route 2, and we actually have our first interesting decision of the game. In the Dream Yard, you can get a Pokemon that complements your starter. This is by design to help you with the first gym, who will always have a type advantage versus you. But do we really want the monkey Pokemon? On one hand, it would make the first gym really easy with the type advantage. But on the other hand, if you wait till after the first gym, there are better overall Pokemon in the route. Pansage doesn't do anything that other grass types don't do, but for example, Mana, who you can also get in the Dream Yard, gets Yawn, Moonlight, and Lucky Chant. I decide that we can beat the first gym with the Pokemon we have, and we can afford to think long term instead of short. We head to the first gym with our team of three Pokemon. The first gym is not very difficult, and we definitely didn't need Pansage. We only need to use Lillipup. Lillipup with Leer, Tackle, and Bite is enough to beat the combination of Lillipup and Panpour. For each Pokemon, all we do is Leer one time and then start attacking. The AI likes to waste turns with Workup, and we don't even take a lot of damage in the process. We handily clean up the first gym and move on. If we got incredibly unlucky with critical hits, Patrat could have helped out too. Unfortunately for all our preparations, in the Dream Yard we get Purloin instead of Mana. Purloin is still better than Pansage, but Mana was definitely the best Pokemon there. In Route 3 we get Piddove, and then in Wellspring Cave we can use a Repel tactic. By using Repel in the cave we can avoid a wild Pokemon until we run into a Dust Cloud, which will be guaranteed to have Drillbur. Drillbur has a high attack stat by our standards and also gets a relatively good move for the early game. Dig. 
Then in Pinwheel Forest, we can either get Time Pole or Timber, and unfortunately we get Time Pole. Timber would have been a lot better for the second gym, who is actually pretty tough. Lenora is one of the tougher gyms, which is unusual for a little lot. Ordinarily, the toughest gyms are late game. Lenora is tough because besides her Pokemon being evolved, the first Pokemon has Intimidate and the second Pokemon has Retaliate. This is honestly a well thought out strategy. The first Pokemon is tough and even if you manage to knock it out, all it does is set up Watchhog's base 140 power Retaliate with a Stab Boost too. It's already Gym 2 and we have to pull out the advanced strategies, the pre-damage technique. We start with a Time Pole who has been pre-damaged. The AI will always use Takedown here because it sees that it can one-hit KO the Time Pole. Time Pole's Bubble Beam and Takedown's Recoil means that Herdier will be put in the range of dying to Drillbur's Dig. But we've also planned something special. We've edged the Drillbur as it's called in the Pokemon community. The level cap is 20, so we brought Drillbur at level 20, but with enough XP to level up after knocking out Herdier. By knocking out Herdier and leveling up, Drillbur gains exactly enough speed to outspeed Watchhog. Because Drillbur now outspeeds Watchhog, we can use Dig to dodge Retaliate which would have been a base 140 power move. Now that we've avoided the major obstacle, it's a pretty clean win for Drillbur. It's unlikely but Drillbur could have gotten in trouble versus Watchhog because of Hypnosis. In that situation, we would have sacrificed Patrat. In any case, the Drillbur Dig strategy lets us avoid the Retaliate and we get our second Gym Badge, and honestly the toughest second Gym Badge we've had to get so far. We head to Castelia City and I catch a Sand Dial in Route 4. This is the Pokemon I wanted because it means I can guarantee to get Dwebble in the Desert Resort through a Repel strategy. Dwebble is great because it naturally has two great abilities, Sturdy and Shell Armor to avoid critical hits. Additionally, it's one of the few Pokemon to naturally get Stealth Rock, which might be useful later on for certain strategies. Maybe. Additionally, in Castelia City, we get the Eevee Light, which is an important item for our team. It helps us combat the lack of bulk we have, at least a little bit. We have to fight Castelia's gym leader, Berg, who's a Bug-type trainer. Luckily, we can take advantage of our newly found Eevee Light. Tepig can easily take on Whirlipede 1v1 because of the type advantage. Then, Drillbur can easily take on Dwebble because it's not weak to rock like our other flying or fire type Pokemon. Then, for the actual challenge, Leveni, we use Eevee Light Roost Pidove. Pidove's type gives it a huge advantage. All you have to do is make sure that you always use Roost at the right time to make sure you stay out of critical hit range. If you do that, then Pidove easily takes down Leveni for our third gym badge. We have our first few rival fights now, and Bianca is pretty easy because her starter is weak to ours. Our Tepig beats her Servine, which was supposed to be her strongest Pokemon. Sharon is next, and he's tougher because his best Pokemon, Dewat, beats our starter Pokemon. We have to use a strategy that takes advantage of the terrain. Sharon's fight happens in the sand, and our Drillbur's ability is Sand Force. We use Hone Claws one time, and with the combined power boost, we now have enough strength to one-hit KO the Dewat, neutralizing it from attacking. Drillbur finishes the rest of the fight, and we can move on further and catch a lot of new Pokemon. We catch Yamask in Relic Castle, we get the Arken Fossil and revive it in Necreen City, and then we get Dwebble in the Desert Resort by using a Repel Manipulation Strategy. By using Repel with a level 21 Pokemon, we can guarantee to only find level 21 or above Pokemon. The only possible level 21 or above Pokemon is Dwebble, thus guaranteeing to get it. The Dwebble happens to have the sturdy ability, which is good. Then we catch Mincino in Route 16, Cottony in the Forest, and then Trubbish in Route 5. This begins our first challenging fight versus N, one of the main antagonists. We lead with Dwebble and get up Stealth Rock which is useful for N's Darumaka. Darumaka is deceptively strong and we want to make sure Darumaka faints before it ever gets to show off that attack stat. Dwebble beats the Sandile 1v1 because of the type advantage with Bug Bite. Then Darumaka comes in but because of the Stealth Rock we got earlier, Smackdown now one hit KOs the Darumaka. Scraggy switches in now but the combination of Dwebble and Arken can beat it easily. The real threat is Sigilyph though, who is much stronger than our Pokemon. Before the fight, I bought the Thunderwave TM and taught it to Purloin, who is also holding the Eviolite. 
With Eevee Light, Purloin will never faint to an air cutter critical hit and will always be able to Thunder Wave the Sigilyn. From there, Purloin wins the 1v1 as the AI makes some questionable decisions and we win the fight. This sets up a showdown with the Electric Gym Leader. The Electric Gym Leader is deceptively tricky because of the Emolga. The Emolgas love to use Volt Switch and it's tough to get a solid hit on them. Here, I take that tendency and use it to my advantage. I go in with the plan to sacrifice Yamask to get damage on both of them. Yamask can lift two Volt Switches, which means it can get Nightshade damage off on both of them. I do risk critical hits here. If Yamask gets critical hit, I'd have to go to my backup plan involving Sandial and sacrificing another Pokemon. Fortunately, I don't get critical hit and it sets up my strategy, Rock Polish Dwebble. Yamask sacrificed itself for damage on both the Molga, and now both the Molga are in range of Dwebble. Dwebble will never faint because of Sturdy, and that gives me a chance to use Rock Polish. With the damage from before, Dwebble can use Smackdown to one-hit KO each Emolga, one after the other. Zebstrika comes in next, but it's completely walled by Drillbur. Drillbur beats it 1v1 with Dig, and we get our fourth gym badge. We have another Charon fight, but this time we have a lot more Pokemon, and it shows why we picked Tepig. Cottony shuts down Dewat with a type advantage, and Charon is not a problem at all. Then we catch a few more Pokemon. We catch Ducklet on the bridge, Vanillite in the cold storage, and Fungus as a guaranteed encounter. The fifth gym leader, Clay, is up next with his ground type Pokemon, and we go back to pre damage techniques. We lead with a pre damage Purloin who uses Fake Out. This does exactly enough damage for Arkin's acrobatics to always one hit KO. We needed to pre damage, that way the AI tries to knock out Purloin with Bulldoze instead of using another move like Swagger. Then, I use Cottony to beat Palpitoad. If I ever get my accuracy dropped by Muddy Water while switching in, I can switch out to Ducklet and come back again later. I can do this until I don't get my accuracy drop. Excadrill is a finisher and its attack stat is devastating and from a Nuzlocke context, its Rock Slide Flinch is a run killer. We only have one shot and we can't risk getting unlucky. We have to find a way to play around it. We use Eviolite Prankster Cotton Spore to lower Excadrill's speed while also living a hit. It can't flinch anything if it's going to be slower than them. Unfortunately, now here there's no way about it. A Pokemon will have to risk dying to a critical hit versus Excadrill. It's way too strong and Rock plus ground coverage is universal. Cottony's Prankster will always be good throughout the run, so Sandile volunteers as tribute. Unfortunately, it does get critical hit on the switch in and faints. Unlucky, but it was accounted for as a possibility. Then we sacrifice Ducklet to get a little damage on Exodrill while also not putting it in healing range. Finally, with the speed drop and two sacrifices, Drillbur shows up to complete the job and takes down Exodrill with Dig. The plan was to sacrifice one Pokemon for sure and two if we get unlucky. Maybe next time Sandile could have tried harder. Next, we catch a Pharaoh Seed in Chargeston Cave, a Deerling in Route 7, and a Litwick in Celestial Tower. Litwick's ghost typing is pretty valuable, especially when we sacrifice your mask earlier. Then we head to Skyla and her flying type gym. Our strategy is to get Stealth Rock up and then set up agility with Arkham to outspeed and knock everything out. Step one is to paralyze Swoobat to remove the chance of Heart Stamp Flinch. Step two is to get Stealth Rock up. Step 3 is to keep using Flash to lower Swoobat's accuracy, thereby reducing the chance of a critical hit. I couldn't find a true 100% win strategy here, so we'll have to settle for an extremely likely win, not a guaranteed one. I don't like doing that this late in the game, but it can't be helped. Then we go to Mincino and spam Charm until Swoobat uses Amnesia. Then, once it uses Amnesia, we use Encore to lock that move in. Then we go to Arken set up agility, and sweep the rest of the team because of Stealth Rock. We could have lost that game if Fubad got a critical hit through Paralysis and the accuracy drops on Mincino, and then again versus Arken because a critical hit would trigger Defeatist. With the Flying Gym over, we have a rival fight with Sharon. Sharon isn't a threat. What we're interested in is his Leftovers item. If we can thief Leftovers from his starter, we can keep it. It turns out that starting in Generation 5, you don't get to keep an item you steal from a trainer. 
Basically, I wasted my time trying to create a strategy that could beat Sharon and also take the leftovers. Oh well. We move on and we catch Cub Chu in Twist Mountain and get the substitute TM, which is only available in the winter. Cub Chu is really important. We actually didn't have a Pokemon that could use Surf. Fishing isn't available until the post game in black and white. With Surf Cub Chu, we can backtrack and get a lot of surfing Pokemon. First, we get Frillish in Driftvale City. Then we get a Shelmid in Isura City. We really want Shelmid to be Shell Armor so that we can avoid critical hits. First, I check the Shelmid to see if its ability is Hydration or Shell Armor. If it happens to be Hydration, I would ignore this encounter and try to get Shelmid again on Route 8. That's how good a Shell Armor Pokemon can be. I would lose an encounter for the chance of getting a Shell Armor Pokemon. Fortunately, the Shelmid we find here is already Shell Armor. We can tell because the Shelmid isn't healing its status condition. Then we catch Scraggy in Route 18 and we head to the Ice-type Gym Leader. We lead with Dwebble to get Stealth Rock for Bear Tick, which is the strongest Pokemon. Dwebble beats the Vanillish 1v1 and that brings in the mighty Bear Tick. We have to sacrifice a Pokemon now and we give up Patrat whose only job was to die. With Patrat gone, we now have a clean switch to 1 HP Lillipup. Lillipup has the move Reversal and it's holding the item Black Belt. Along with Stealth Rock, that means Lillipup does enough damage to knock out Bear Tick in one shot. The last Pokemon is Cryogonal who's completely walled by Recover Frillish. Frillish beats Cryogonal 1v1 and we get our 7th Gym Badge. And you might have noticed, how did we get Lillipup to 1 HP? We got Lillipup to 1 HP by using Substitute and running away 4 times versus Wild Pokemon. We had to find a workaround because in Generation 5, you don't take poison damage while walking around, so it's harder to intentionally reach 1 HP. Heading to the 8th gym, we have to do a little bit of prep. We catch Golet in Dragon Spiral Tower, and then we fight Bianca, who is not much of a threat. Afterwards, we catch Ponyard in Route 9, Vullaby in Route 10, and then we use the Repel strategy to get Axew. By repelling with a level 31 Pokemon in the cave, we can guarantee to get Axew. Finally, we do two important things. One, we buy the Blizzard TM, which costs a lot of money, and then we get the Icy Rock item. This is all for the next gym, the Dragon-type gym. We lead with a Purloin who's ready to die. Its only job is Paralyzing Fracture. Then, we bring in a Vanillite who's also ready to die. Because of T-Wave, it now outspeeds Fracture and we can use Icy Rock Hail before fainting. Finally, we go to Cub Chu and Blizzard to knock out Fracture. Drudigan comes in next, but we don't have the power to one-hit KO it. We have to stall a little longer by using Protect, Substitute, and then Protect again. Slowly but surely, we get enough Hail damage to put Drudigan in range. Then, we knock it out with Blizzard. This is why we needed the Icy Rock, to have enough time to perform this operation. Finally, we take advantage of the fact that the AI likes to use Dragon Tail here because it would get the KO. Because Dragon Tail has a negative priority, that means our Cub Shoe gets to outspeed Haxorus. We don't get the KO with Blizzard alone, but Hail is enough to finish it off. Cub Shoe unfortunately has to faint for this to work, and we finish the 8th and final gym. There's a few things to tidy up, and then we can go to the Elite Four. We have our last rival fight. First, we use a Mental Herb, Inner Focus, Thunder Wave Ponyard to beat Unpheasant and avoid getting flinched down by Air Slash. Then, Frillish defeats the entire team, including Samurott. Another reminder for why we picked Tepig. Then, for our last but not the least encounter, we get Mianfu and Victory Road. Finally, we get the Rocky Helmet item which will be useful in the Elite Four. Now for the Elite Four, we can pick the order but it doesn't need too much effort. The only restriction is that we have to do Caitlyn and her Psychic type team first because we're bringing back the pre-damage technique for her. We also leave the Dark type Elite Four member for the end because we will have to sacrifice versus him. Versus Caitlyn, we start with Mianfu who uses Fake Out and then U-Turn. That gives us enough damage for Ponyard's Night Slash to one-hit KO, while also baiting in the Psychic Attack for it. Ponyard baits in Thunderbolt Gothitel, and here's where Pre-Damage Golit comes in handy. Pre-Damage Golit will always faint to Shadow Ball, which makes the AI go for it. That means we can create a free switch into Mencino, who can then Encore Gothitel into Shadow Ball. 
Then we can set up Workup and Substitute and Encore Gothitelle back into Shadow Ball every time the Encore runs out. The reason we have to do all of this is Sigalyph, who outspeeds the entire team and can flinch with Air Slash. The only way to play against the flinch for a Pokemon that strong and fast is to have a substitute up or be able to outspeed it somehow. Last Resort gives us all the power and accuracy we need and we one-hit KO every Pokemon she has left, Gothitelle, Sigalyph, and Musharana to get the win. Next up is the Ghost-type Elite Four member, but it's all the Vullaby show. Kofagrigus is fodder for Vullaby, who has Rest, Nasty Plot, and Tailwind. All we do is set up and then win the game with Dark Pulse Spam. If we ever get too unlucky with Kofagrigus special defense drops from Shadow Ball, we would have to go to Mincino and come back. In general, there's a lot of PP stall strategies that work out here, and I just picked a strategy that was the easiest. Up next is Marshall the Fighting type trainer, who is not as easy as the other two. The key here is going to be using Rocky Helmet, Iron Barb, Ferroseed to generate large amounts of damage. We use a combination of Golette and Ferrothorn to chip down Throw. Throw will always use Payback versus Golette, and we can use that to go to Ferroseed and get Rocky Helmet plus Iron Barb's damage. Remember, Steel resists Dark in Generation 5. Then we can go back to Golette as Throw tries to use a Fighting type move versus Ferroseed. We can repeat the process to get as much damage as we need. After I get enough damage, I go to Mianfu on Payback instead of Ferroseed. I outspeed and KO the throw with Acrobatics. Then versus Conkholder, we use the same strategy. Conceptually, the idea is to switch back and forth between Grass Knot and Hammer Arm with Ferroseed and Golet. Grass Knot happens to be one of the few special moves that is also Contact and therefore triggers Iron Barbs and Rocky Helmet. We first stall out Stone Edge from Conkholder and then begin the switching back and forth. Many turns later, Conkholder finally knocks itself out while trying to grass knot a Pharaoh Seed for the millionth time. Mianshao is next, but Jump Kick's recoil is 50% if it doesn't work. First, we use Protect to dodge one Jump Kick, and then we go to Golet the Ghost type to get the other 50% of damage. Sock is the final Pokemon and will always go for Stone Edge versus Golet, so we beat that 1v1 with Earthquake. The next and final Elite Four member is the Dark type Trainer, and we have planned to sacrifice Pokemon here. We're going back to Rocky Helmet strategies, and we're going to use a little bit of switch stalling, but we're going to be doing it for a defined reason, not just to get as much damage as possible. The first switch stalling is with Pharaoh Seed and Friends versus Scrafty. Our Mianfu is relatively fast, but it's also really weak. Even though it has a type advantage versus the Dark type Elite 4 member, even super effective moves aren't strong enough. It's the price to pay for being unevolved. We need to get other damage first, and then Mianfu can finish the job. It's the same pattern as before. We switch Golet on a Fighting type move, then Pharaoh Seed on the Dark type move. Then, on the last time, we go to Mianfu on a Dark type move instead. We do this to knock out Scrafty, and next up is Lyper. However, we don't want to knock out Lyper. We want to keep doing damage to Lyper without knocking it out. Pharaoh Seed is the perfect way to do that. We don't want to affect the game state here either by doing any extra damage or doing anything that could ruin the plan. Everything has to be exact. That's why we use Thunder Wave versus Limber Lyperd. We're using it as a sort of waiting move. Lyperd keeps on attacking our Pharaoh Seed until finally it gets too low on health. Then, while the AI uses Full Restore, we use that as a chance to go to Vullaby. Now we Toxic Stall the Lyperd and the timing is the most important part. We can always rest to heal up while Toxic goes to work, but we also have to manage the chance of critical hits, we have to manage the full restore and Toxic at the right time, and then we also have to set up our end goal perfectly. Ultimately, our goal is to rest and wake up and make a move right as Leopard faints from poison. When that happens, we want to use Tailwind. And now, it all comes together. After Leopard faints, we get off the Tailwind, and then we go to Pharaoh Seed, who took neither too little damage nor did too much damage. It's in the perfect position, and now it dies to Crocodile in the quickest way possible while also doing the most damage. Now, we go to Mianfu, and because of Tailwind, we outspeed, and because of Pharaoh Seed, we have enough damage to one-hit KO the Crocodile. The main job is done. Bisharp comes in next, and Tailwind runs out. 
We sacrifice Vullaby to Bisharp and that gives us a free switch to Mincino. We sacrifice Mincino to get a Thunder Wave off on Bisharp. And finally, 3 deaths later, we finish off the Bisharp with Drain Punch Mianfu to beat the final Elite 4 member. Ordinarily, we would have the champion fight now, but Pokemon Black and White instead replaced that with a plot about Team Plasma. We're allowed to access the PC, which means we can change team members out. The story makes it mandatory to catch the Legendary, but of course we won't be using it. We use the Master Ball to catch it and then deposit it in the PC. This leads us to part 1 of the main event, the fight versus N. N is a step above any of the Elite Four members, mainly because his team has a lot of type diversity and also has a legendary Pokemon. He's too powerful to take on head to head, so we do have to get a little crafty. We have to take advantage of Zekrom's biggest weakness, the moves it has. Or rather, the moves it doesn't have. Golette and Ponyard completely wall every attacking move Zekrom has. We can literally switch back and forth between Golette and Ponyard and we can run Zekrom out of attacking moves. Once Zekrom is out of attacking moves, we go to Dragon Dance Axew. Zekrom can do nothing but watch as its dad uses Dragon Dance again and again and again. It happens that our Axew's ability is Mold Breaker too, which means that it bypasses Karakosta Sturdy. Even an Axew is terrifying at maxed out attack and it can one hit KO every Pokemon in N's team. That leads us to part 2 of the main event and is the fight versus Getsis, and we use a similar strategy. Kofagrigus is walled by Lillipup and Ponyard. We switch between the two until we PP stall Kofagrigus out of Psychic. Then we go to Lillipup and use Substitute. Now Kofagrigus can't do anything anymore to Lillipup. We max out our attack stat and then knock it out. Hydreigon, his best Pokemon, comes in next and it can break the Substitute, but it dies in one hit. Finally, the AI sends in Bufalon next and we knock that out too. Seismitoad shows up now and outspeeds Lillipup. We want to keep Lillipup for later so we sacrifice Golette. Our plan now is to U-turn with Arkin to Axew and repeat because Seismitoad won't use a Water-type move versus a Dragon-type. After enough U-turns and an Axew sacrifice, we put Seismitoad in range of Arkin's acrobatics and we knock it out. If we had gotten unlucky with the damage on Axew, we could have done the same U-turn strategy with Frillish too. Bisharp comes in next, but our Eviolite Ponyard can take it on. We use Ponyard to get Thunder Wave off on Bisharp. We sacrifice Ponyard and bring out Lillipup from earlier. Because the HP is low enough, Reversal one-hit KOs and we use it to outspeed and knock out Bisharp. The final Pokemon is Electros. We have to sacrifice Lillipup to Electros, and then we go to Arkin. And why Arkin, you ask? Well, now we U-turn into Frillish. But why Frillish? It's because this whole time, Frillish is actually holding a Sticky Barb. You might remember Sticky Barb from the Pokemon Platinum run, and it's a very important item here. We sacrifice Frillish who dies in one hit, but during the one hit, it's causing a lot of recoil damage for Electros. It's not only causing Wild Charge recoil, but it's also giving Electros a Sticky Barb. Now, every turn, Electros is going to be taking recoil damage from its attacks and Sticky Barb damage. With Arcan, we substitute one time to generate even more damage, and then before we activate Defeatist, we use the move Thrash to knock out Electros and win the fight. With exactly one Pokemon left, we survive the Pokemon Black Little Lock. With exactly one Pokemon left, we survive the Pokemon Black Little Lock. Thank you all for watching and let me know down in the comments below who you think the most valuable Pokemon of the run was.